um, our next panel, uh, Beyond uh, the Revolution Beyond Its Borders. Uh, the idea with this was to expand our thinking about the revolution, um, to think about it literally, what happened beyond those borders of the 13 colonies turned states, uh, but also thinking about the revolution more generally, um, how it's affected events and people and individuals beyond just uh, North America or the United States. Um, and in some ways, uh, Adriana just gave me a quick update on some of our online viewers, and it's kind of fitting, uh, given what she's uh, uh, told me. We've had over 200 people uh, zooming into our sessions online. Uh, she tells me that there's an incredible debate going on, particularly on uh, our box cast. Um, so that's really exciting to, to, to hear. They're coming from over 20 states uh, so far in three different countries. Um, so in many ways, this conference reflects the interest uh, that be, is beyond just those original Eastern 13 states. Um, so to uh, chair this panel, we invited Elijah Gould, who much of his research has very much been thinking about the revolution on an international stage. Uh, if you don't know uh, of uh, Elijah's work, uh, he is a professor of history at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, his first book was The Persistence of Empire, British Political Culture in the Age of the American Revolution, which won the Jamestown Prize from the Omohundro Institute. Uh, empire Nation, the American Revolution in the Atlantic World. And uh, most recently, Among the Powers of the Earth, the American Revolution, and the Making of a New World Empire, which won the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic Book Prize, and was a finalist for the George Washington Book Prize. And he's currently working on a project uh, that I think is absolutely fascinating. I think everybody in this audience, if you're here, will as well. It's called Crucible of Peace, and it's going to be a study of what he calls the least study of the United States' founding documents the Treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War. So we, I can't think of a better person to host this conversation. Lige? Pat, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. That's very kind and very generous. So uh, yeah, we have to figure out uh, who's sitting where. Um, <laughs> yeah, Kathleen's going to speak first, so we <laughs> keep this all straight. So anyway, and uh, Pat, I also want to thank you and the other organizers. Uh, for me, and I think a number of us are in the same position, this is uh, my first in-person event in, uh, you know, since March 6th. Uh, <laughs> and I think we've been making a list of all the things that we missed. I mean, there, there have been good things about... Uh, spending lots of family time, but you know we also uh, uh, missed these wider contacts, and it's just wonderful uh, to be here. And I've been reminded of just how important uh, the colleagues in this room and and online are, uh, you know, not just intellectually but personally, and you know, the real friendships here. So it's just wonderful. I come from a family of big men and women who cry. Uh, I'll spare you that West Kentucky tent meeting experience, but uh, anyway, it's really wonderful, so. <laughs> okay, so when I, when I teach the Declaration of Independence to my classes at the University of New Hampshire, one, I oftentimes say, uh, what, what does it take to, be, uh, to become an independent nation or state? And, and then Red Sox nation, what if we wanted to become, you know, 603 nation? You know, what would we have to do? Now, professor. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, it, it, this is to underscore the fact that independence is actually a three-legged stool. You do declare independence, but you also have to, to, to establish a government uh, that, that is effective, there needs to be a governing charter, uh, and as we saw before lunch, that includes a government that can win a war. Uh, and you also have to secure foreign recognition. Uh, and uh, the, the Declaration actually recognizes all three of those tasks, uh, most famously in its con concluding lines uh, when it is addressed, and its primary audience probably is a candid world. Obviously, it is also to explain to Americans what this struggle is about. But uh, um, so the purpose of this panel is to think about that wider uh, context. Uh, and of course, to speak of the world in 1776 is to use a deceptively simple monosyllabic word for a place that Americans tended to view as not one but several. Uh, and I'm going to use Thomas Jefferson's first presidential address uh, from 1801 to Congress. Uh, he divided the world that mattered most to Americans into three parts. First, the United States' sister nations, 
in Europe. Uh, that, that was probably the candid world uh, uh, most envisioned in the Declaration, followed by the Barbary states of North Africa and ending with what Jefferson called our Indian neighbors. Uh, that, of course, did not exhaust uh, the world with which Americans were entangled. Uh, at that point, uh, uh, India, China, Sub-Saharan Africa, the rest of the Americas could easily have appeared on Jefferson's list, and they surely belong on ours, too. So uh, with those and other questions of mine, Pat uh, asked uh, my fellow panelists and me to discuss what uh, we might call the world of the American Revolution. And joining me in this endeavor are Kathleen Duvall, uh, a professor of history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the author of a number of important books and articles, including wonderful reviews in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> they really, it's like, uh, most, but but no, notably for us, uh, her wonderful independence lost, uh, Lives on the Edge of the American Revolution, published by Random House in 2015. Uh, next up, uh, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, well, down at the end of the table, uh, Saunders Director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, Professor of History at the University of Virginia, and author of The Men Who Lost America, published in 2013, which was a winner of the George Washington Book Prize, uh, not just a finalist, uh, and the inimitable <laughs> right, uh, Freedom of the Human Mind, just out with uh, UVA Press, Jefferson's Idea of a University. And uh, finally, Ashley White, associate professor at, but although Ashley's going to be talking before Andrew, so uh, sorry, I'm getting confused here. Uh, associate professor of history at the University of Miami, an author of Encountering Revolution, Haiti and the Making of the Early uh, Republic, which won the Guibert Chinard Prize uh, uh, from the Society for French Historical Studies in the Institut Francais d'Amérique. Uh, so, uh, with that, I think we're going to have Kathleen start. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, right, yeah. Well, my understanding is, I, yeah, okay, so, right, yeah. So, I am, uh, yeah, the, 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 fair, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're very informal up here. I also want to say that we're really going to try to keep an eye on the time and limit ourselves to, to 30 minutes chatting among ourselves and then open it up to question. So, Kathleen. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> what the revolution beyond, and actually beyond its borders, uh, because you're looking at space uh, that is beyond the borders of the settled, can we say, part of the, yeah, no, we're not even going to say that. Uh, uh, that's why I didn't want to It's just a question. trap, I know. Yeah, exactly, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, Lars. The, the revolution in the West and on the Gulf Coast. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I'm, thank you to everyone who organized this. It's such a pleasure to be here in so many um, exhilarating ways. Um, this is obviously a panel about the revolution beyond its borders, and, and I think before its borders, obviously at the time of the American Revolution, um, today's borders, uh, hold no meaning at all. Um, as I like to tell my students, um, Francis Scott Key didn't write a poem that included the lines from sea to shining sea. He was just really hoping to hold on to Baltimore. Um, <laughs> so uh, boundaries of the United States aren't clear in 1765 <laughs> when it doesn't exist, uh, 1776, 1783. Um, and so I think North America, as, as we all know, is much more than those 13 colonies. Um, and the revolution, the revolution and the Revolutionary War involved much more than those um, because, you know, and, and 13 isn't some magic number that was uh, destined to be. To quote um, the person on the panel that I learned this from, there were not 13, uh, to misquote, I'm sure, as I do in every class I ever teach, um, there were not 13 colony, th 13 British colonies at the time of the rev revolution, there were about 26, and another sort of magical number Andrew talks about in his first book. Most of them, um, as Andrew's first book taught us, uh, had Stamp Act protests, or at least Stamp Act grumbling, and only nine of them sent representatives to the Stamp Act Congress. Once there was a Continental Congress that actually did have 13 colonies represented, those Representatives of 13 colonies kept hoping that the number would end up being 14 or 15 or 16 if Canada and the Floridas would only join them. Then beyond the British colonies, as we all know, there were empires involved besides Britain, um, involved in North America. The Spanish Empire um, came out of the Seven Years' War 
on the losing side and yet um, expanding its empire. And so by the time of the American Revolution, the Spanish empire on the map at least and in the forts that, the, that Spain has placed in, goes all the way to the Mississippi River. It's uh, South America, Central America, um, Mexico, Texas, up to the Mississippi River. And then during the American Revolution, Spain won several battles against Britain um, at Mobile and Pensacola. And by the Treaty of Paris, Spain has, if I would show you a map if we were showing maps, on its map of the Americas, the border of this, between the Spanish Empire and the United States is the Flint River in Georgia, which makes Georgia basically only Savannah, and um, goes straight up from there into the Ohio Valley, and include, the Spanish Empire includes those very lands that uh, um, had sparked the Seven Years' War previously. Um, and of course, Native nations are, as we've talked about already today, a vital part of the struggles for independence in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, the multiple native wars of independence, as Dan Richter put it earlier today. In 1776, most of the continent was still under native control, the control of multiple different, often competing native nations, um, including those parts of the continent that we accidentally sometimes draw in our textbooks and such as being part of the United States in 1783, um, including that sort of Flint River area that's really clearly still Muscogee country at that point. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, like myself, have been, you know, when we work on a textbook or something like that, painstakingly taking note of how wrong our sort of visual representation of space is in 1783 when it, it, it is not the United, the United States is still only a sliver of this continent. Um, so, native wars for independence during the revolution, before the revolution, during the revolution, after the revolution, into the late 19th century, um, and continuing in, in non-military form, legal form, uh, other kinds of social, cultural form into the 20th and 21st centuries. As the U.S. grew in population and power, increasingly other peoples began to band together to try to stop what one Spanish official in St. Louis put it when he was meeting in 1784 with a delegation of over 200 Cherokees, Shawnees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Delawares, and Haudenosaunees. Um, Spanish official agreed with them that this was a plague of locusts, this United States. Um, or the War of 1812 coalitions that again tried to bring together people who didn't agree on much, um, but agreed that the United States was becoming too power, was threatening them too much. Um, the coalitions that Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa put together in the north, um, and in the south among Red Sticks and Seminoles and Maroons, um, all armed by the British, proclaiming liberty for themselves. Um, so they're just several ways that I think a lot of us are already thinking about, about beyond the borders of the 13 colonies. Um, so finally, just, just to wrap up, um, I hope that looking beyond these borders, um, one of the things that we can talk about as we are looking toward 2026 is that independence and freedom are not inventions of the American Revolution. Um, they're also not inventions of British political philosophy or the European Enlightenment. But instead that as the Onondaga leader Clear Sky put it in 1794. We are of the same opinion with the people of the United States. You call yourselves free and independent. We as the ancient inhabitants of this country and sovereigns of the soil say that we are equally as free as you or any other nation or nations under the sun. Thank you very much, Kathleen. So. Um, I want to turn next to Andrew. We're actually using the order that Ashley suggested. So, uh, and Andrew, I, I mean, uh, of course, uh, you know, the candid world did not include Native America uh, that, that in, in the Declaration, but it certainly did uh, Europe and, of course, Britain. Uh, and uh, your, your work, of course, has dealt uh, it, it in depth with this. I wonder if you... What, what are you right, about? thank you. Well, firstly, uh, Kathleen is right. I said there were 26 colonies in British America. Uh, Jack Green would tell you there are 36 <laughs> uh, because he counts every place that has an assembly as a colony, uh, which would make the Leeward Islands six colonies, but it only has one governor. So <laughs> I thought my response was simply, well, it's 
the number of governors and, and the unit that the British defined. Uh, but Holly Brewer reminds me, of course, that Delaware did not have a governor. Uh, so, <laughs> and just in case you see a lot of different uh, numbers, the point is, though, 36 works better for me. Uh, that, uh, you know, there were more colonies outside of America, and uh, my current work is continuing with some of, uh, or at least trying to look at the implications of some of my first book. I'm currently doing a book with uh, Trevor, um, um, gosh, his name's Bernard. Bernard, sorry, I was going to say, uh, Trevor Bernard on the British Empire and the American Revolution, uh, using uh, the imperial perspective to really help us better understand the American Revolution. Uh, and I think there are three major benefits, but I'll suggest other things that you could use the ex... I mean, I'm interested a lot in policy, but I will talk about how it can also illuminate other areas uh, of current interest. Firstly, uh, I think it can help us better uh, contextualize British policy. There's often a sense that the policies that Britain pursued in the 1760s were very ad hoc um, and simply responses to immediate uh, needs. But if you look at the policies throughout the empire, you really start to see some cohesion and themes. Clearly, there was a deliberate effort at more centralization. Clearly, there was an effort to uh, increase uh, revenues, and uh, also to improve security and build up a military presence. Interestingly enough, that is also true of the Spanish and French empires. In fact, the biggest castle complex in the Americas is in Havana, in Cuba, and much of that was built during the 1760s. The Spanish and French were spending a great deal more money on their navy, and their islands than the uh, British. And I've published some of this already, um, although I'll be expanding on it uh, in uh, my book with Bernard, uh, but um, it's in essays to the memory of Paul Langford, uh, edited by Perry Gaussi. Then the second area where I think looking at the imperial perspective can help is better understanding and prioritizing the causes of the uh, revolution. In my first book, I said you, you can better understand and look at the British Caribbean to better understand uh, and prioritize the causes, but I didn't actually spell out how that might work. Uh, so I'll just give you some examples. And again, I published this part uh, in a very recent book with Frank Cogliano and uh, Patrick Griffin on Ireland and the Atlantic world, I was particularly interested in making a comparison between Ireland and the British Caribbean, which to me seemed most relevant for America because they all had their own parliaments or assemblies uh, and a similar political um, structure. But you know, if you look at it, there are at least four different explanations of the revolution in Virginia, none of which uh, address each other. I mean, there's Woody Holton's Force Founders, Timothy Breen's uh, Tobacco Culture, Reese Isaacs on the Transformation of Virginia, to name just a few, all giving different explanations. But it's interesting to ask how you might want to have students prioritize these, you know, what is really most important. Clearly, there are multi-causes, although we often write as though we have monocausal explanations for uh, events. And then, of course, there's Edmund Morgan with um, you know, his thesis about the role of slavery. Well, the British Caribbean is especially interesting in terms of that. I think the very first talk I gave at the McNeil Center was called the Edmund Morgan Thesis up, uh, Upturned. It was a slightly mischievous and misleading title because I was not actually attacking Morgan 
at all, but simply pointing out that uh, slavery in the Caribbean, if anything, helps to account for why they remained loyal rather than why they rebelled. And there's an easy way to reconcile the two uh, because the proportion of slaves is very different in the Caribbean. It's over 90% to uh, Virginia. But it, it was, I thought, a good example of how you can debate and prioritize uh, some of the causes that are given as leading causes. For example, Breen putting a big stress on uh, debts in the South as an explanation of the revolution. Uh, the debts were greater in the British Caribbean. And the point about the British Caribbean and why it's a good comparison is not so much that they didn't rebel. We can understand small islands. It's physically difficult. But they didn't even write pamphlets supporting America. They really didn't engage in the pamphlet war other than three pamphlets during the Stamp Act, all basically supporting a loyalist position. And virtually the only pamphlets of that kind anywhere, since loyalists really didn't exist. And that's a, an insight uh, we can thank Mary Beth Norton for. Uh, be, before uh, 1774, there was not a distinctive loyalist um, tradition. And then finally, uh, it's useful for understanding the war and why the British lost, that they're engaged in so many theatres and overextended. I'm currently doing a piece really to draw out the implications of my book on the British side that's less emphasizing this imperial dimension and more the war as a counter-insurrectionary struggle for the British, like Vietnam and Afghanistan. I might have commented earlier that we do seem to have a blind spot as a profession to doing military history, and that there's real value to it. Um, I knew, in actual fact, most uh, countries have lost these counter-insurgency wars. There's a marvelous debate between Piers Mackesy and John Shy, who's been mentioned earlier, that's gone completely under the radar because they were friends and they didn't really, you know, they didn't want to play it up. But Mackesy actually disagreed with Shy that this was Britain's Vietnam and argued that the war was winnable. And it actually was lost on me in his original book that he was just shifting the blame from the politicians to the military. And um, the example that, uh, uh, that he gave was that the British were very successful in Malaysia in the late 1950s, and they won. And it became the myth of the British that they would have won Vietnam. Uh, and I finally got some time during the lockdown to read up on British counterinsurgency warfare and they did indeed win in Malaysia, but the circumstances were very unusual. Firstly, it was an ethnic Chinese uh, rebellion. It didn't involve, you know, it was not popular in the general uh, population. And secondly, there was no foreign support, which seems to have been critical in nearly all counterinsurgencies. Thirdly, it took them many years and a great deal of cost and ruthless methods. And they did the same in Nigeria with the Mau Mau Rebellion for which they've now paid compensation. It became a public embarrassment. Uh, so in other words, counterinsurgencies can be won, but usually they're not. And usually they're not defeated uh, the main power just decides ultimately it's just not worth the benefits to stay. Uh, and if they do stay, they can be there forever as the British were in Ireland. I mean, you could say that was a successful counterinsurgency. Um, but eventually, even they decided, and they defeated the 1916 rebellion, but they decided it just wasn't worth going on. 
Um, but there are other ways I think this broader approach can be helpful. Uh, I think, for example, uh, Mike McDonnell recently did a uh, comparison of indigenous peoples in the empire and outside uh, and their experience. Why not a book uh, comparing the impact on native policy and indigenous peoples between Canada and America? You know, it'd be very interesting. What, what were the real implications if the country had stayed, uh, stayed British? But I see I've already overstepped <laughs> my time. I did want to thank Patrick, too, for this event. Uh, it's been immense fun to get together and just talk. Thank you. No, no thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so, uh, and now Ashley is going to talk about the Caribbean, though Andrew's had things to say about that already, but, but particularly the French Caribbean. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this is hugely important to the founders. It may not show up in the uh, 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 declaration, but, but this is probably the region of the Atlantic that matters most to them. Uh, uh, anyway. Hello, and thank you for coming. It's a pleasure uh, to be here today, and thanks to everyone at the APS who's made it possible. It's, it's, it's fun to be here <laughs> with you um, and to be talking about the possibilities for 2026. And um, I, Lige is right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Caribbean, and I guess my approach to the Caribbean has, has I've, I've, I've come to it as, um, as many practitioners in this room have for a kind of a paradigm of the Atlantic world, right? If we were thinking about a, a major thread to reconfigure the 13 colonies beyond borders, then the Atlantic world has become a paradigm for the past 20 years has really animated scholarships in some really dynamic ways, right? And the Caribbean is, is that's one route through which the Caribbean has come a part of, of the North American story, right? Or at least, that's how I, how I got into it. And so when I was thinking about our, our panel today and, and sort of reflecting, say, on this particular stream of scholarship that's happened um, in the interim between uh, 1976 and uh, 2026, um, I was wondering, so what would the Atlantic world give us, right, to, to thinking about uh, 1776 in a, in a kind of new way, right? So, and there are lots of ways that are going to do it. I'm going to highlight a, a couple <laughs> that I think uh, work and that also lean to some of the things I've been interested in, especially um, in connections between the, the French Caribbean and, and, and North America. And it seems to me that one of the first things that the Atlantic world um, brings to bear on this notion of the 13 colonies beyond borders is that the, the revolution and the independence was very dependent on connections, right? As, as Lige pointed out, that the third part of that Declaration of Independence is all about trying to make a, a claim in the world. So why they might have been rejecting the British Empire, they were in no way rejecting the Atlantic world. In fact, they were very dependent practically and ideologically, you all know this, on, on cultivating new connections, rejecting some, uh, and, and looking for others. And this was, this was happening across imperial lines, across, um, uh, across the lines of uh, mercantilism, right, which had been alighted as all that great work on smuggling has taught us over the years. But, but sort of you see the ways that it involves sort of multi, it becomes multilingual, it becomes transnational before the nation, right? Um, we all know this and I, I think that um, is a very important message for 2026. The way that those 13 colonies did not reject the world when they rejected a particular empire. Instead, they were very much tied to it, very much looking out toward it, right? Um, and that, that those relationships have always been complicated and problematic and, and dynamic. Um, but I, th I think we need to hear that. <laughs> um, that needs to be part of our public programming in 2026. And I think the Atlantic world offers us some creative ways um, um, to, to get to that. I also think that the Atlantic world scholarship lets us play with um, chronological borders too, right? In that 1776 is a big moment and, and anniversaries are, um, are blessings and curses, right? For, for helping us think about these, these landmark moments. But 
if we think about uh, the American Revolution, right, we know it's a part of a, a whole sequence of revolutions, right? Um, in some ways, there was um, a desire to see it as moving as a kind of chain, like America does it first, that's a problem. Um, and we have, we have the French Revolution, we have Haitian Revolution, we have other revolutions in Europe, we have other wars of independence in, uh, in Spanish America, right? So, that there's a way that um, 1776 is, is just a beginning for what becomes the United States, but also for revolutionary movements. And those revolutionary movements have a kind of feedback loop on what independent mean, independence means in the United States, right? Um, even the peace treaty doesn't end what, the, what constitutes independence given what happens in this world. But I also think it's tied to, to looking backward, right? Um, in that the, uh, the war for independence was in many ways a civil war. I, I totally agree with uh, David on that. It's also, an, it's an answer, another way to talk about it would be an anti-imperial or an anti-colonial project, right? And in that way, we can draw connections with other kinds of revolts and rebellions in the Atlantic world, whether it's Tacky's revolt in Jamaica, which Vince Brown has talked about brilliantly, whether it's Maroon Wars in Jamaica, whether it's Macandal in Saint-Domingue, um, that, that we can see and better sort of have a better sense of what constitutes notions of independence and freedom by thinking about it within these kind of longer durees, as long as, as well as uh, sort of the English civil wars that were, were talked about um, before lunch. I, th I think there's a way that by considering these 13 colonies as part of an Atlantic world, we get to look outward and think about how those things outward are affecting inward. And, and given the fact that we're all wearing masks and what we've been through, this seems to be a message that's really imperative and I don't think it's gonna go away for 2026. Um, and with that, I'm gonna stop because I know that the reason we're here is to have a conversation um, and so, so, yeah, I want to open it up to the audience, but very quickly, I'd actually like to pick up on a couple of things you said, Ashley. Uh, you talk about, I mean, one of our recurring themes has been the American, you know, the transformational uh, dimensions of the revolution, but also the, the continuities with the, the, the imperial order that Americans both are claiming to overthrow, but are also perpetuating. And uh, this is very much present in the international dimensions. I mean, as you say, this is an anti-colonial uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, revolt. It's a successful one, and that in itself is transformational. Um, it, it also is, is uh, you know, in this bid to be for acceptance, one of the really interesting areas where Americans make a claim to transformation is in the area of slavery. I mean, the anti-slave trade uh, 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 enactments are, are, are quite, you know, quite striking. Uh, and yet, of course, we know uh, uh, that, you know, particularly in the southern colonies and states, uh, the revolution ends up entrenching slavery more deeply. So I wonder if, if the th our three panels want to sort of talk about this uh, juxtaposition of transformation of, of, an, of, of a, a colonial order, uh, but also persistence of it. And actually, why don't you lead off with this? Because of course, Haiti is, is so important to that story, right? I guess in that way, um, I would argue that the, the Atlantic world helps to throw, in throw these kinds of things into relief through comparison, right? So, um, so I, you know, I can talk about the Haitian Revolution all day, so I'll just do a little bit. But I think um, what you, what you, well, first of all, that the relationship, obviously, between the U.S. and, and French Saint-Domingue is, is long and deep. It's, it doesn't just happen uh, with, with uh, the, the French Revolution. And, and the Haitian Revolution. But I think the, the Haitian Revolution makes really clear for various actors in, in the early United States what the parameters of, of their freedom and independence were, right? Um, and, and pushes those, right, in the ways that the Haitian Revolution uh, works to realize not just freedom for people of African descent, but also their citizenship in the, in the fullest sense of the term, right? And in an attempt to, to achieve that, it ends up declaring independence, right? And, and I think the, the, 
that power of, of comparison points to some of the, the continuities, the colonial continuities that persist in this new transformative United States. Um, and, and also the ways that, as, as the panel was talking last night, that the Pandora's box of language has been opened and people are, are pushing it in directions which um, uh, those who maybe held the power to unlock the box did, did not necessarily anticipate, right? Um, and, and so it, it persists on this kind of feedback loop. Kathleen, do you want to pick up on this as it, it plays out in um, Indian country, uh, uh, Native America? Yeah, I've been, it's this question of, of transform, transformation and persistence of a colonial order, I've been sort of thinking it through lately and um, in terms of Native nationhood and what leaders of Native nations right on the border of the United States, what they're articulating in these years of the revolutionary in particular, the early Republic years of what they're saying about their own nations, what they're changing in their own nations. And um, I have, one of the things I've been taking to it is some of these questions of the revolution and, and in fact, uh, sort of thinking about the um, audience and the powers of the earth and wanting to be one of them, as you, you know, you, you talk about so beautifully in your book, the, um, you know, for example, the Cherokee Nation, I, that really has helped me to think about what, what are Cherokee national leaders saying about the Cherokee Nation in this era? And because I, your book helped me realize they're speaking to a global audience. They want British and French and Spanish um, and, uh, you know, eventually Mexican and Canadian, you know, various sorts, um, to see them as a nation, as one of the, uh, as among, um, as among the powers of the, as, as nations on the same footing as the United States and that should be dealt with in treaties and, uh, and in other ways like, like a nation. And um, I think that one of the things I, I think sort of an, old, an older way of sort of incorporating Native history and African American history into um, the history of the revolution was kind of put them in one lump together. And I think one of the great things about recent scholarship has been to to separate those things, and I, th I think nationhood is is essential for understanding both the native present and the past as uh, as a uh, something that continues through this era that it, it, it transforms because nations change and right they uh, they change in the era of revolution they change in the 19th century and that doesn't make the Cherokee Nation less of a nation there are some things that make it a bit less of a nation but it gets extremely powerful and um, in some ways terrible neighbor um, but but the I, 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 what I, one of the things I'd like to see for 2026 is, is, the, is Native nations, nationhood, as it changes and evolves in this era right alongside U.S. nationhood. Oh, thanks. And, and Andrew, do you want to jump in on this, and then we're going to open up yes, to the uh, audience? It's quite interesting to see how it plays out in the rest of the empire. Uh, Ireland and the West Indies use this crisis to gain greater autonomy, but they're not interested in actual independence because in both places there's an elite that has no interest in sharing power in the West Indies, white elite obviously. Uh, the West Indian assemblies abolished themselves in the 19th century except Barbados rather than share power with free blacks and yet they have those same Whig radical roots, um, you know, similar ideology and assemblies, so it does show how things can play out. I've always speculated, uh, but uh, South American historians disagree with me, that race is a key to understanding problems of the revolutions in South America and elsewhere in the Caribbean, the desire not to share power, and the issue of race. And Hannah Arendt said it was because they hadn't had assemblies, and so it, didn't lead to uh, you no know, more stable system. But I have to tell you, I've never found m many who do South American history who agree with me. And because there's a certain myth that they don't, there isn't a race problem. Uh, and then uh, in the West Indies in Ireland, you've got the volunteer movement in Ireland. And so Ireland becomes largely self-governing, but only with Protestants represented it represented 25% of the population. And the West Indies is, gets the promise of the Carlisle Commission in 1779 of no taxes ever, um, and a withdrawal of a lot of measures that uh, the colonies hadn't liked. But 
the long-term uh, impact is actually initial relaxation by the British, but then to become much more authoritarian. And so they absorbed Ireland in 1800. Uh, it has to be said, Pitt wanted it to be an enlightened and to give Catholics the vote, but George III refused. Uh, <laughs> I, who, he has much more culpability for that than the American Revolution because it would have solved the Irish problem uh, <laughs> if only they could have assimilated the Catholics. Um, and as I mentioned with the West Indies, uh, you start to get direct crown government beginning with Trinidad in the late 1790s. Uh, and the British government starts to take over the East India right. Company gra very gradually until it abolishes its in 1854. A lot of that, of course, is in response to the French Revolution, the, uh, the yes. other dog that has yet to bark on this panel. But <laughs> let's see if anyone in our audience <laughs> wants to uh, bring up France or, or anything else. I, I want to thank the panelists for this interesting discussion. My question is for Andrew. You mentioned the debate between the friends uh, as to what how, how the revolution got lost, including the friend who said it was because of the, the generals weren't confident enough, if you will. And you wrote the book, The Men Who Lost America, with such wonderful descriptions, including of how with the eyes that operated independently of each other. Um, and I was wondering, listening to this debate, does it change your thinking? I mean, was it the generals being incompetent or was it more online of the French invading on behalf of the, the colonists, or was it that the British got tired, or was it all three? Well, I always worry that academics probably thought that was a frivolous book, uh, but, but the, whole, uh, the whole intention was to argue that leadership is a distraction, the idea these people failed, a distraction from the real essence of the war and why the British failed. You know, which ultimately was about not having the support, uh, despite people saying a third were loyal, a third neutral, a third uh, uh, revolutionary. Um, so, in fact, I would play down the role of leadership altogether. It reminds me a bit of uh, The Best and the Brightest, which is another book I read during the break which a lot of period, people in the Vietnam period read uh, by David Hamilton, arguing here you had some of the most gifted uh, people mainly left over from the administ Kennedy administration like McNamara and yet they made so many horrid errors. And I couldn't help thinking of the parallels of uh, people telling Johnson directly this war is being lost and uh, doing similarly to George III and Lord George Germain, and they're sometimes actually not hearing what was said to them and coming out of the meeting, uh, as George III did with General Gage, with a completely different impression of what it was he'd actually said, uh, almost the opposite, reminding us how it's easy for people to deceive themselves. So, although... I mean, retrospectively, clearly the leaders would make different decisions. I'm not sure if they'd made those decisions. The outcome of the war would have been any different in any case, and the same most recently with uh, Afghanistan. Uh, John Shai told an anecdote about um, uh, Mackesy in the introduction to the second edition of the uh, War for America, and I couldn't understand at the time why he told it. It seemed like private gossip. And that was that uh, Mackenzie's father had been held responsible for um, the failure of a campaign to get to Bridgehead in Norway, a kind of early D-Day. And his father had refused as the naval admiral in command to land the troops, thinking that... Uh, in actual fact, the mission was going to be a complete failure. And it was a huge embarrassment to them as a military family. And Mackenzie spent his entire career as a military historian obsessed with responsibility and guilt. But what he would do is essentially to shift the guilt uh, from whoever was being blamed to someone else. Um, 
and he particularly shifted it on Lord George Germain. He even wrote a book called The Cow de Minden, <laughs> saying that um, you know, Germain had not been a cow de Minden, and, uh, and going into great length, um, the Battle of Minden, 1759, uh, and he was just obsessed with leadership, as I think we still are in warfare. Yeah. So. And it often distracts from the real issues. Yeah. So. Can we go to an online question? Sure. Yes. Sure. Okay. So um, this is a question from T. Richards for this panel, but really one for the entire conference, and maybe we can come back in the conclusion. So the way that most students and teachers will engage with the American Revolution is through U.S. surveys at both the high school and college level. This means that the American Revolution gets maybe a week of attention for the entire era. So how do we make choices about what to include in those three lectures? <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> Kathleen's reaching for the mic. Yeah, I feel like I just have to confess that as much as I spend my life talking about everything else, I, uh, I mean, my students read the Declaration of Independence, you know? <laughs> I guess I do think that, I know this sort of came up earlier, like the, the civics lesson is maybe the most important one for students to get, and that it's you know, to read, read the Doc Declaration of Independence, understand its different parts, and uh, then move into the, who the revolution included and who it left out, and sort of on its simplest version, because it, it's only in three lectures, and then I mentioned Pensacola in like one sentence, and then <laughs> right. so, as, I, as in many things, I don't live what I, what I write uh, in the classroom. Yeah, I, I know that. Uh, it's the same thing. I, I mean, uh, the, my opening remarks about, I, I do actually teach the Declaration that way, and uh, I would never give a whole lecture on the Paris peace negotiations, <laughs> even in an upper level class on the revolution. But, but nonetheless, you know, it's anticipated in the Declaration itself. So uh, try, it, it's, it's not enough to have an aspirational statement. You also need to understand that the realization of those aspirations is itself a complicated uh, uh, process, an unfinished one. I mean, our three words from last night, transformational, unfinished, and confusing. And uh, the, that's, you know, that really sums it up pretty well in many ways. <laughs> Well, someone said earlier it's very difficult to teach the American Revolution because it's so much part of the national myth or story. I think one of the ways to make it interesting is to ask your pupils some questions um, because otherwise this can be just very dull information of the policies that often just seem ridiculous of the British that lead to the revolution and it doesn't spark any debate. So I would ask questions like, was there British tyranny in America in 1776? How do we define uh, tyranny? Is a small tax on tea really tyrannical? Um, <laughs> and try and shake things up. I was very impressed. I recently was contacted by a high school in uh, Wisconsin, my old stamping ground uh, to the extent I have an association I'm uh, a cheesehead mm -hmm. and uh, I was impressed they were asking these quite kinds mm -hmm. of questions uh, anything that can make people debate uh, rather than trying to tell them what to think uh, yeah. hmm. any tax in New Hampshire is tyrannical <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested in connecting the previous session before lunch and, and this one about experience of war and experiences of, of revolution and interested to know what your thoughts on about new scholarly threads that are being pulled in terms of international experiences of war, of the American Revolution and the war for independence and uh, in places like the, for the people of India who maybe witnessed naval battles or uh, the so British soldiers that went and French soldiers that went down to the Caribbean after fighting in the, in the 13 states, or what women and children who came all the way from Germany brought back to Germany after the war, those kinds of things. Ashley, do you want to jump in on this? And sure. I, I think what they, um, uh, they show the, uh, the, the connectivity of, of, of the revolutions, with, especially around stories of people, right? If this has been one of the, one of the, the themes that we've, or means th through which we've explored talking about um, these 
big, complicated, messy, transformative processes. Um, I think the scholarship that's been tracing the diasporas of black loyalists, of black soldiers, um, that's probably the literature I know best, right, is helping us to see the ways that for actors at the time, right, they're not necessarily seeing the 13 colonies on, on the map that uh, Kathleen already critiqued, right? That they are, that they are seeing the, their geographies in, in different ways. And as they move through those geographies, right, they take with them those experiences, albeit they traumatic, sometimes exhilarating, um, their particular notion of how they have tried to apply uh, these ideals into practice, either through arms or uh, debate or, 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 or word of mouth, right? Um, I feel like I have to talk about, you know, Julia Scott's book, right? That, 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 that the sense of that common wind, right, is very much along a sea, right? Um, and, um, and, and I, I think that, that excellent work in following those populations um, is, allowing us, is allowing us to see the 18th century from all these vantages which people at the time saw the 18th century. Not like the way that we've seen these geographies, but other geographies and currents are emerging as we follow the people, as we follow the ideas, and most recently for me as we follow things, like material culture, but. I, I would add to that, um, because I think it, it's the same kind of shifting the geography, but in a completely different place. And one of my favorite, um, I, I'm going to start calling the pandemic era, a Andrew Wood, the, the, the I got to catch up on reading era. <laughs> Such a lovely way to imagine that's the way that year went, that two years went. Um, but <laughs> one of my favorite books that I read in that time was uh, Susan Sleeper Smith's new book, which takes place in the Illinois country, Ohio Valley. And it's about you know the 20-year war for independence that the Shawnees and others fought, um, and what it meant to sort of win and yet have war in your homeland for 20 years and have your towns burned over and over in the process of of winning, <laughs> um, and what that how that is lost in the in the long run. And I think that does one of the things that book does that I think maybe we need to bring back to scholarship in the 13 colonies is is about uh, homes and play some of the things that uh, that that Lauren was talking about earlier. What, what does it what, what does it mean when when war comes inside your house um, and on your fields if if you're a Shawnee woman, right? Um, so if I'm reading, it's hard to read body language, and the most important part of the body is covered by a mask. But I think Kyle is indicating, yeah, one more. Okay, so time for one last question. Uh, okay, uh, Mark Peterson gets that the last word. Um, so. <laughs> There are a lot of ways in which I very much appreciate the framing of revolution beyond the borders. But there's one part of it that concerns me a great deal, which is the way in which that very framing tends to sort of falsely reify the consolidation of what's inside those borders, right? It, it, the, the suggestion is a kind of uniformity in, in the United States, whereas uh, I'd like to you know, highlight the extraordinary variety, diversity across those, you know, sometimes 12, sometimes 13, sometimes nine, whatever colonies, as a way to think about the very kinds of connections you're talking about here, about how, di just an example off the top of my head, the time of the revolution, the very small New England region has about 800,000 free white colonists, whereas Georgia, which claims a territory the size of France, has fewer free white colonists than Massachusetts had in 1640, right? There's this just extraordinary difference among the units that make up this. And I do think it shapes what you're talking about. So I'd kind of like to hear you talk about the internal divisions in this and, and, and the fact that what they were framing was a kind of coalition among sovereign states at the time and how that connects to what you're talking about in this larger world, right? Mm -hmm. Just how, um, spongy <laughs> an entity the United States was during this time. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's actually a great question, Mark. I'll start off and then we'll just, uh, each one of us will have a, a brief response. I think for me, the, the whole reason to study the revolution from this standpoint is to reappreciate how protean 
the United States is. I mean, for me, the model treaty is the, written by Franklin and Adams, uh, uh, which imagines the United States that has never existed. Uh, it's a much more maritime uh, union than the continental one that we now think of as the destiny. It includes uh, the Bermuda, Bermuda, the Bahamas, uh, uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. Uh, uh, so it, it's a very Atlantic. Uh, centered union, and uh, you know, it, it, uh, um, and I think that fluidity is actually part of it. And in many ways, the Arles Confederation, which includes Canada as the 14th state, it's the 14th state that never happened, uh, is uh, and it it it, it 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 captures this sense of fluidity uh, that becomes more rigidified as a result of the Constitution, and we've talked about that. But uh, yeah, I, to my mind, I think if you do this the right way, you come away with a very keen sense of just how fluid and protean uh, the United States is in every possible way. Yeah. I think I'll just give the one word answer from last night. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was useful to compare the colonies that don't rebel and their attitudes with loyalists and they're very similar in other words whether it's the protestants in northern ireland who ironically were the most radical in terms of their response to british policies or the west indian planters uh, they are all critical of british policies but they simply don't accept that this is a case of tyranny uh, and they're much more interested in gaining as much autonomy as possible. I always think it's very fun to think about the lawless once they leave America, or those who do, and of course Rebecca reminds us most didn't and remained and were integrated, uh, but those who do became really troublesome in whatever, wherever they were represented. Uh, my favorite example is the Bahamas where you had Lord Dunmore uh, better known for his time in Virginia and clearly somewhat uh, cut down in terms of his stature as governor of the Bahamas. Uh, and he just finds the uh, loyalists incredibly truculent and difficult to deal with. Um, and so it, it does, I think, illustrate that they weren't just believers in passive obedience. They weren't traditional 17th century style Tories, they shared very much in common with the Patriots. It was mm -hmm. just, was this an appropriate moment uh, to rebel? Yeah, great. And Ashley? I'll just say quickly that I think actually by looking at the 13 colonies from beyond the borders, not like looking from the 13 colonies out, but from, from the beyond the borders in, it would help actually to identify some of that very sponginess which you're calling for, right? That, that, that we could get the purview of other, other others in the Atlantic world or as they are trying to figure out what these 13 colonies are and what they are claiming to be and, and why is it that they understand um, that Caribbeanist colonists might have a better understanding of South Carolina than they do of, 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 of um, I don't know, Rhode Island, right? So that, that in, it helps us think about it not just from the perspective of, of those on the fringes of this continent, but how all these other sites in the world are, are trying to make sense of what this thing is now calling itself and what exactly that contains. And I think that is actually an extraordinarily useful um, mode for thinking and deploying the, the Beyond Borders uh, paradigm. So. so I think that brings this to a close. So just please join me in thanking. Uh, <laughs>